We now turn to the next hermeneutical category, often called the historical element. Sometimes, if you want to impress family and friends, you can use a German phrase. Maybe you've heard it before. It certainly pops up in some academic writing. It's called the Sitzum Leben. That just means the situation in life. And it re referring to the fact that we need to kind of go back in time and go back, in James' case, to the first century and say, what is going on here? What is the trouble in the text? What is the problem that James is trying to address? Because, of course, James, when he wrote his letter, he's not just sitting down in the abstract and then kind of thinking to himself, what shall I write about today? I don't know. Maybe I'll write about faith and works. So he's not writing about faith and works in some kind of abstract way. No, no, no. There's some specific problem, some real situation that he has in mind. And so now we need to know what that real situation is so we can interpret his words in its right context. Now, right away, we have a question whether James is describing a real situation or a hypothetical one. A number of scholars observe that in the preceding passage, which our passage is closely connected to, the first half of chapter 2, there are some if clauses. And then we also have another if clause in our passage. And they say, well, all of these if clauses, it sounds like James isn't talking about an actual situation, a real situation. He's just hypothesizing some problem. And indeed, the NIV, I think, uh, translates it with that idea in mind. They don't say, if a brother or sister, in 2.15, they add, suppose a brother or sister, right? As if it were some kind of imaginary scenario that James is coming up with. One scholar says, for example, how realistic is this incident? He's talking about brothers and sisters who are poor being either uh, prejudiced against or being neglected. He says, the Greek construction James uses to describe this incident, on plus the subjunctive mood, suggests, though it does not require, that James is giving a hypothetical example. And the hypothetical nature of the situation is underscored by the indefiniteness of brother or sister. So here's one scholar who concludes that James isn't addressing a real situation, but rather a hypothetical one. However, I want to disagree with that on four grounds. First of all, there is a grammatical argument. Notice the previous quote, the scholar conceded, though it doesn't require that James is giving a hypothetical example. Under grammatical, you may or may not remember that I said that this if clause, this conditional clause, this third class conditional clause, is better uh, understood as describing a general situation, rather a common problem. And so I think rather than say James is just imagining something that might happen, he's actually instead referring to something that is happening. In fact, it's happening with some commonality or frequency that it's so serious that he devotes a good chunk of his letter to addressing it. That leads to the next response, which I've already alluded to, the kind of contextual argument. There's a certain emphasis given to this passage, not only by the length, all of chapter 2, James seems to deal with so many subjects in a short, almost a haphazard way. Our chapter sticks out actually like a sore thumb in the letter as a whole because it's such a large block of unified material. That's one way in which I think it is emphatic. It seems to be describing a real situation. But then the other emphasis we talked about earlier under grammatical, he doesn't say just a brother, but he says a brother or a sister. And then when he talks about lacking uh, daily food, he uses the rare form of the participle, highlighting that this was an ongoing or continuous situation. Two scholars are struck by this, and they say, this is Blomberg and Kamel, James could be presenting a hypothetical objection for the sake of his argument, right? That's possible, but it seems likely that some in his congregation were making precisely this inquiry. Why else would verses 14 to 26 rebut the viability of a lifeless orthodoxy so strenuously? Right? Why is James so animated in this discussion if it's only an imaginary or a hypothetical or made-up problem? Third, there are two words that are suggestive in verse 16. One scholar rightly makes this comment. He says, two little words make it clear that this situation is not simply a parabolic analogy. James says, if someone 
from among you. It's three words in English. It's only two words in Greek. Right? Says, right, 2.16. So if James were only making a comparison, James simply would have said, if someone says, not specifying someone from among you. And the fourth response I have is this. Even if I think that this is a hypothetical or rhetorical argument, remember, I don't. But even if the situation is hypothetical, James picked this hypothetical situation. In other words, James wanted his words about faith and works to be heard in a particular context, namely the context where poor people were being discriminated against or neglected. And so therefore, that's how we ought to interpret it, whether it's real or imaginary, whether it's real or rhetorical. One scholar who argues for the rhetorical position actually makes exactly this point. Dwayne Watson says, even if the historical situation or context is hypothetical, historical information can still be gleaned from the example because it, that is, this example was selected to address a specific rhetorical situation. So let's turn to that situation, which I suggest to you is a real and from James' point of view, sadly, far too widespread and common problem. Now, on a general level, the problem is easy to understand, and I've already referred to it a couple of times, and that is the poor are being discriminated against. They're either being discriminated against in the first part of the chapter, or they are being neglected in our passage in the second half of the chapter. And we can find that quite clearly in 2.15, right? The church fails to help out a brother or sister who is without clothes and daily food. And then in verses 2 to 4, remember there's a close connection between our half, the second half, and the first half. So in verses 2 to 4, it shows how the church shows special attention or favoritism to the rich while it neglects or discriminates against the poor. So on a general level, it's not hard to understand. The, the interesting thing, the little tricky thing is, when we get a little more specific, there are two options. One option is we should think of a worship context. And remember, our passage is closely connected to the first half of the chapter. And we read there in verse 2, If a man comes into your meeting. Now in Greek, James uses the word synagogue. And even if you don't know Greek, you hear the word in English, synagogue. And that makes sense because, remember, James is writing to Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians who would think of their church gatherings as being similar to their previously Jewish synagogue meetings. Now, when James refers to their gathering as a synagogue, if a man comes into your meeting, into your synagogue, one thing he could be referring to is worship, because worship is one of the things that happens in a Jewish synagogue, and therefore, not surprisingly, one of the things that would happen in a Jewish Christian church. And if that's the case, then verses 2 to 4 are quite clear. A rich person comes in with fine clothes and Lots of bling, lots of rich jewelry, and we read in the text that the church gets all excited and shows this person a special place. And then a poor person comes in. They're obviously poor. Their clothes aren't very nice. They don't have all the nice fancy jewelry, and the church kind of neglects them. So one way to envision what's happening in the churches to whom James is writing is that there is discrimination against the poor in the context of worship. However, if there's option one, There's going to at least be option number two, and that's the case we're going to turn to now. Remember, the text says, if a man comes into your meeting, in Greek, your synagogue. Well, lots of things happen in a synagogue besides worship. The synagogue also is a social gathering. That's where Jews would just kind of come together and hang out. The synagogue was also a location for education, for schooling. And yet one other important function takes place in a synagogue, and that is the adjudication of legal matters. Jews, and therefore Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, are supposed to do the same, according to Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. They don't go running to the secular law courts when they have a disagreement with a brother or sister. No, they deal with it in-house. And that might be also or in addition to what James is describing. In other words, there might be a lawsuit, some kind of disagreement between a rich Christian and a poor Christian. 
and they handle it within the church community as they ought. But the church sides with the rich person just because he's rich, even though the evidence sides with the poor. And strengthening the legal context is verse 6, where James says, Is it not the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Now, on one hand, it really doesn't matter whether it was a worship context or a legal context. The more important thing is, we now know that when James talks about faith and works, it isn't in some mythical world. It isn't some abstract theological argument he's having in his head. No, no, no. He's thinking about a very specific situation. He, James, the likely brother of Jesus and the head of the church of Jerusalem and the Jewish Christian churches in the area of Judea, has a serious problem of discrimination on his hands. And it is serious. Because remember what the law of God is summarized as. Not only loving God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, but also loving our neighbor. And interestingly and importantly, James cites that second law in the preceding verses. In verse 8, he explicitly says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you will love your neighbor as yourself. And so the context the sitsum laban, the historical setting of the passage, is important and quite clear. The church, in some sense, is neglecting and discriminating poor members within its fellowship. And this is, again, uh, so crucial uh, for understanding how his dichotomy of faith and works needs to be understood. Well, we move on to other questions of historical nature. Again, we're kind of going back in time and saying, what's going on here? And so we turn next then to, um, oops, here we go, right there. We turn to uh, the negative example, right? Uh, The expression isn't coming out there on my screen like I'd like, but it goes like this. So the first example is where... um, Uh, A Christian sees somebody who's hurting and uh, who is in need, who's pretty closed. And then what do they say? They say, go in peace. Now, in Hebrew, this is actually a fairly common expression, right? To go in peace. Lachu l'shalom. To go in peace. And what do you call a kind of common expression of either hello or farewell? We call it a cliché, a cliché. Notice how the NAB, the New American Bible, translates this verse. They, they translate it as the Christian saying to the needy Christian, goodbye and good luck. Now the second command is also important, where the rich faith The workless Christian says to the needy Christian, keep warm and well fed. Earlier we talked about how the fact that this could be interpreted passively, right, or middly and with an active sense. But now I want to talk about something else. It's interesting that the two commands match exactly the two needs. Remember earlier, the brother or sister who is in need is described as one being naked and two lacking daily food. Well, those two needs are perfectly matched now by what the, what the Christian uh, says to this needy person in response. If you're naked, right, well, then the response is be warm or keep warm. And if you're hungry or lacking daily food, the, the response is keep well fed. And Luke Timothy Johnson rightly makes this comment that the fact that the speaker can so perfectly match the two answers to the two needs, suggests that the speaker truly knows that this person is in need, but nevertheless refuses to help, and thereby it kind of exacerbates how bad uh, this person's faith is. To quote Luke Timothy Johnson, he says, The exhortations, namely keep warm and well-fed, correspond to the conditions of nakedness and hunger, revealing that the speaker knows, and he emphasized that word, not me, the needs of this other brother or sister, but refuses to meet them. So again, it highlights how, again, ineffective and how worthless this kind of faith is, the kind of faith that just utters a pious cliche. See somebody in need and says, well, keep warm and be well fed. 
And James spells out then how valuable or valueless actually this faith is, because then he repeats that fixed phrase, T ta aphelos. What is the prophet? And don't forget, it's that rhetorical question that always expects the negative answer. It's worth nothing. It doesn't profit you anything at all. And in case you didn't get it from that fixed rhetorical question, then in verse 17, James spells it out even more clearly. He says, in the same way, right? In the same way that this person just says something callously, cavalierly, and doesn't do anything, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, it's important to see that James is not doing what many commentators think he's doing, namely contrasting faith and works. James is not contrasting faith versus works. Throughout this passage, he's contrasting instead, in my mind, I agree with this, faith versus faith. Wait a minute, it sounds puzzling. Maybe I need to specify that. He's contrasting one kind of faith with another kind of faith. In the first half of our passage, he's contrasting a false, non-saving, a workless faith with, in the second half, a positive, a saving, a working faith. Douglas Moo, in his commentary on James, nicely expresses this point. He says, quote, It is absolutely vital to understand that the main point of this argument, expressed three times in verses 17, 20, and 26, is not that works must be added to faith, but that genuine faith includes works. That's its very nature. Faith and works can't be separated together. Faith, by its very definition, involves deeds or works. Well, we move from the explanation of the first example to the second one. And this involves the demon's faith, if you will. James says, you know, do you believe that God is one? And at that point, J James readers would have instantly heard something. Because remember, they're Jewish Christians. And of course, in Judaism, as soon as you say God is one, you hear in your mind the Hebrew phrase, Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This is kind of the confession of the Israelite people, that they are a monotheistic religion in contrast to all the other religions around them. And this is an important confession then not only of Jews, but also therefore of Christians and how much more so Jewish Christians. So the demons believe that God is one, right? But apparently that is not enough. As we saw earlier, they shudder, they react in terror and fright. And so James' point seems to be that, wait a minute, the first example where faith is people a false faith is people who are all talk and no action. Here we have demons who have some knowledge, but apparently no action. This knowledge that the demons have isn't sufficient faith. Otherwise, they would not shudder. Otherwise, they would not react with the hair standing on their heads, right, in such a violent reaction. The reformers made a distinction at this point between three kinds of knowledge. It's a technical distinction, but I think it is helpful in this particular verse. They distinguish between notitia, which could be translated as knowledge. This is when you just intellectually understand something, right? You, you, you comprehend it. And then they, dif they distinguish that from a census, which is belief. And that is, wait a minute, you not only understand it, but... You believe that it's true, right? And then they yet distinguish it yet from fuditia, which is trust. You somehow personally commit yourself to this true thing. That sounds kind of abstract and maybe not so powerful. Maybe if we apply it to marriage, it will become more convincing to you, right? It's, more, it's one thing for you to intellectually understand the concept of marriage, right? You say, oh, I understand what marriage is, what it involves, and so forth. That's notitia. Wait a minute, uh, it's another thing for you to believe that it's a valid human institution. You might assent to that truth. But believe me, it's quite a different thing for you to walk down the aisle and ultimately say, I do. You see, that last thing involves a level of personal commitment that I think captures the kind of faith that James expects from his readers. 
Now, we move in a rather significant way in the second half from two negative examples to two positive examples. And the two positive examples come from the Old Testament. No surprise there, because we have to remember, of course, that James is writing to Jewish Christians. So James naturally picks examples that they know, they know well, and they'll find powerful or persuasive. Now, the first example, the first positive example that James cites is an extremely well-known story in Judaism and indeed in the history of the Christian church, and that's the so-called binding of Isaac story. And although James doesn't remind them of all the details surrounding the story, he can assume, rightly so, that the audience knows these details. So if I were preaching today or teaching to an audience that that is not Jewish, or maybe doesn't know the details of the story, I would have to spell it out for them, right? I would have to tell the audience about who Abraham was, that he wasn't always called Abraham, he was called Abram at one time, and how God established a covenant with him, and how he promised that his descendants would be like the sand in the seashore and the stars in the sky. And I would have to talk about how old they were when Isaac was born, right? Abraham was, 80, was 99, and, I, and uh, Sarah was... 89. So all of those details, James assumes his audience knows. And if somehow you know that your audience isn't familiar with these details, you have to make sure that we spell them out because that's part of the force of the story that James assumes this illustration has. Now, As we noted earlier under grammar, when James explains it, he must have in mind, though, a lot more than this one act of faith of Abraham, a faith that proved itself by his, that is, Abraham's being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain of Moriah. And that's because in the explanation, James says, you see that his faith and his actions, remember the plural actions, And then that unique form of the verb, were working together. And so James isn't thinking of just the one act, even though it's a very powerful one that he highlights for his readers. James must also be reminding them of all the actions throughout Abraham's life that testified to his true saving faith. Now he concludes that example with a statement that, well, at first blush again, sounds contradictory to Paul. He says in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith. I'm hesitating because that last word is important, faith alone. If James had just said not by faith, that would even be maybe more puzzling, but it's that word alone. Because when he says alone, James isn't talking about a real faith. He isn't talking about a saving faith. Because for James, True faith, saving faith, is never alone, right? It's always a faith that is naturally accompanied by or a faith that automatically manifests itself with works, with deeds, deeds of obedience and works especially of kindness toward those who are hurting and in need. That's the end of the first positive example, and so we move on to the second positive example, and that is the example of Rahab. And again, writing to a Jewish audience, James assumes that they know all of the details surrounding Rahab and this story. And again, if your audience doesn't know those details, we have to spell them out for them about how the Israelites are wandering around and how they don't have faith as they enter the promised land, and so they have to wander for another generation and how the spies come in and how Rahab receives them and uh, kind of sends the uh, pursuing uh, king's forces on a wild goose chase, right, on the condition, right, that uh, her life and uh, her family be spared. And so the story of Rahab needs to be told to the audience today if they're not familiar with it. Now, this is an interesting question that not all biblical scholars ask. A few do, but not all. And that is, why pair Abraham and Rahab? I mean, Abraham is an easy choice. That's a no-brainer. I mean, Abraham is the father, the hero of the Jewish faith. But why Rahab? I mean, the Old Testament's got all kinds of other heroes of faith, to quote Hebrews 11, right? Why did James pick Rahab rather than some other important or seemingly more important Old Testament hero? Well, one option, and of course I wouldn't mention one option unless there was another one, but one option is that these two, namely Abraham and Rahab, 
nicely are paired together because they exemplify hospitality. Hospitality. Maybe you remember the Old Testament story of Genesis 18, where Abraham gets three guests or three visitors who turn out to be a little bit more significant than that. But anyway, Abraham shows hospitality to them. And of course, Rahab, in terms of showing hospitality, showing housing to the two spies. So, for example, to quote from one New Testament scholar, he says, that is Dwayne Watson, The examples of Abraham, father of the faith, and Rahab, a harlot, are a strange combination, but one found in the tradition. Why? Because both exemplified hospitality. Now, how should we evaluate that? Well, there is a strength to that uh, argument, and that is it would fit the context very well. Remember that James's historical situation is Sitzam Laban is the church is neglecting the needs of poorly clothed fellow Christians and hungry fellow Christians. And so obviously two stories about showing hospitality would nicely fit the context. And another piece of further support could be the fact that in the rabbinic writing, so these are not by biblical writers, these are by the later rabbis after the New Testament times, Abraham, but importantly, not joined with Rahab, just Abraham alone, was often celebrated and praised for his hospitality. So those are some reasons to support the connection with hospitality. But there are some significant weaknesses with linking them together under the heading of hospitality. The first and by far biggest weakness is that James does not cite the story of the three visitors, Genesis 18, but instead James cites the story of Abraham offering his son Isaac, which is Genesis 22. That's a, that's a huge weakness with his argument. If James could have picked the story from 22, what would stop him from picking the better, more obvious connection from Genesis 18, if indeed the connection in James' mind was one of hospitality? A second weakness is that when you read what James says about Rahab, he talks about not just her providing lodging, hospitality, but also, quote, by sending them out by another way. So she did more than provide hospitality. She also helped them in terms of their escape and their safety. And then a third, uh, less significant weakness is the pairing of these two actually, despite what the quote from uh, the scholar earlier said, uh, is not very common in Jewish or Christian writings. The only place I think where it occurs is 1 Clement 10 and 12. And that's not so significant because 1 Clement is a Christian writing and dates to after James and could well be influenced by James linking these two uh, instead of the other way around. So if that's not the best interpretation, if, if, if Abraham and Rahab are not linked together because of their connection with hospitality, what might they be connected through? And I suggest to you that they provide an example of two extremes, two extremes. Actually, there's a literary term for this. It's called marismus, marismus. And marismus, it, 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 it first and foremost is found in Hebrew poetry, right? That would make sense because James is a Jew and is very familiar then with Jewish writings and Hebrew poetry. But that's where you use two parts, usually extremes, to describe the whole. So, for example, in the Psalms, when the psalmist in one line refers to the morning and the next line refers to the night, he's not referring only to the morning and the night. He's referring to the two extremes of the day in order to describe the whole day. Or again, in Hebrew poetry, where one line refers to heaven and the next line refers to earth, right? We're picking the two different extremes, the two different uh, geographical spheres. So we're trying to talk about every place, everywhere. Or if we're talking about from the root of a tree in one line to the fruit of the tree, right? From the very base of the tree to the extension, we're talking about everything in between. These are examples where two extremes to describe the whole. And in a similar way, we can go to Rahab and Abraham. They are two extremes. Who is Abraham? Well, again, he is the hero of the Jewish faith. In fact, there are no Jews before Abraham. He literally is Abraham in Hebrew is the father of a nation. He is the father of the Jews. He's numero uno. He's top dog, uh, dog in Jewish eyes. But who is Rahab? Well, Rahab is not a Jew, first of all. 
right? She's a Gentile, that's strike one. Secondly, she's a woman. That doesn't sound very politically correct, but that's strike two in that day and that patriarchal culture. And what's worse, she wasn't just any old woman. She was a prostitute, strike three. In fact, it's kind of hard to get any worse than a Gentile woman prostitute, right? Unless somehow you give her leprosy. And so we have the two extremes, and it doesn't really matter whether you're the great patriarch or uh, Abraham or the prostitute Rahab. The call for faith is the same, a true saving faith that manifests itself, that demonstrates itself in concrete acts or deeds. Here's a quote from a scholar or two that might convince you that I'm not just imagining this, but this actually is convincing. Blomberg and Kamel say, quote, The two exemplars of Jane's principle of works complementing or uh, vindicating, or sorry, completing or vindicating one's faith, namely Abraham and Rahab, contrast with each other in several respects, creating a powerful marismus, a figure of speech which makes equal the most extreme members of a whole and therefore all the other members who fall in between. And so again, it doesn't matter whether you're the great patriarch Abraham or the prostitute Rahab. It doesn't matter whether you're a bigwig in the pecking order of culture and society or the church, or whether in your mind you're just a nobody, a pew sitter. The call for true faith is the same. Namely, that true saving faith manifests itself in works of kindness and obedience. Well, we get toward the end of the passage, and there in verse 26, we get a simile, a just as, so also construction. And it's a pretty powerful one, because uh, in that day, we have the body, which is physical stuff, but the body needs to have the spirit to, so to say, come alive. So spirit here isn't capital S, as in the Holy Spirit. It simply is the life principle. We read about that in Genesis 2. After God formed uh, Adam and Eve, he he kind of breathed into them, right? Uh, The breath of life. Or in Ezekiel 37, we have the valley of dry bones, and then we have to have the spirit that kind of gives them life. And so the idea is, if you have no spirit, well, then you end up with a dead body. And by analogy, if you have no works, you end up with a dead faith. And so this simile actually brings the passage to a rather powerful and dramatic conclusion. As James says, faith without deeds is dead. Exegesis is hard work. It's not easy to approach the text from a grammatical, a literary, a historical, and one more yet a theological way. But we're going to bring our discussion to a close now. And when we come back, we're going to bring it to a definitive close. And we're going to finally answer the question, does James contradict Paul or not? And so thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to resuming the discussion in just a moment.